have the opportunity today to uh, talk with Thomas Bartman. Thomas is a senior research fellow with the Forum for Growth and Innovation at the Harvard Business School. And we're going to talk about Tesla and disruption of the automobile industry. He's got a very, he and his colleagues who put this uh, paper together that's going to be appearing shortly in the Harvard Business Review. Uh, he's put together a very interesting thesis. He thinks that uh, Tesla is, uh, is using the wrong business model. And so we want to find out uh, more about that and uh, enlighten, obviously, our viewers here to, uh, to what their thinking is and uh, explore when he talks about disruption. He's, it, it, their, their premise is, is that the disruption is going to happen, but it's not going to happen where we think it's going to happen. And that's the intriguing part. So, Thomas, thank you for doing this. Appreciate having you. Thank you very much for having me. I'm happy to be here. Great. Look, do you mind me calling you? Would you prefer Thomas or Tom? Tom is great. All right, good. I will do Tom then. That's fine. Look, well, the title of this, this the, the title of this paper is "The Curious Case of Tesla and the Rise of the Electric Vehicle." So I'm interested as to how uh, this particular uh, paper come about. What was the catalyst? Sure. So I work for Professor Clay Christensen, who works here at the Harvard Business View right. Business School, and has developed the theory of disruptive innovation. And about September of last year. An investor in Tesla came to Clay and said, I think I've discovered an anomaly in your theory of disruption. I believe that there's actually a high-end disruption and right. that the first example we're seeing of it is Tesla. And one of Clay's fundamental beliefs is that the way you improve the quality of a theory is by investigating anomalies to that theory. And so with that friendly challenge, Clay asked me and our research team if we would be interested in investigating Tesla, and so we did. And over the course of the next few weeks, we investigated Tesla based on how they fit with the theory of disruptive innovation as he's developed it. Okay, well, that's for, for people who are not, and believe me, I was not until I read the paper, <laughs> familiar with the theory of disruption. So give us a, a little bit of a primer on, on what that is. Absolutely. So what started Clay's investigation into disruption was he asked the question, what is it that causes great companies to fail? And what he discovered was very counterintuitive. And that was that it's not an entrant that has a better product or service than the incumbents that causes the incumbent to fail. It's actually entrants who enter with less quality less performing products and services that improve over time that cause incumbents to fail. And that's very counterintuitive. You wouldn't expect that if you were a business leader. And so he wrote a book that is called The Innovator's Dilemma. Right. Because that's the dilemma. And so what do you do if you're in that position? Well, what he found by studying the uh, computer disk drive industry and then later the steel industry is that typically what happens is in this form of competition, entrants who come in with better products and services than the incumbent firms lose. Hmm. All else equal, the incumbents are able to win those battles. And the reason why is that incumbents have significant resource advantages. Right. They have customer relationships. They have deep wells of R&D knowledge. They have all of the motivation to attack those players. And likely the best outcome you can have if you enter with a sustaining innovation is that the incumbent buys you. Yeah. And so what happens with the disruptive innovation is there's two kinds of disruptive innovations. There's a low-end disruptive innovation, which is that there are customers in the existing market who cannot utilize all of the performance that's delivered by the incumbent companies. And they're happy to trade some degree of performance for a dramatically lower price. Uh, yeah. So an entrant comes in with a product that traditionally, by the traditional metrics, looks like a joke. It doesn't perform nearly as well. In fact, frequently, it doesn't even start in the same category as the, the manufacturer. A new market disruption are people who are not rich or skilled enough 
to do what that product does. And so a perfect example here is the mainframe computer industry. If you look at original mainframes, you had to have a physical central location where people would take stacks of punch cards to specialized teams that would then run the punch cards through the computer and deliver the result. Well, the mini computer allowed that to be decentralized. And now engineers who had less skill and less money could utilize computing power. And then the personal computer did it again and it opened up to everyone. The laptop has since been a new market disruption that has disrupted the personal computer, the desktop. And so what happens is incumbent players in the low end disruption flee up market because the customers the low end disruptor is stealing are the least desirable customers to that company. Ah, okay. By avoiding selling to those people, you actually improve your margins. And so you're not terribly upset that you've lost those sales because those are the customers that were never happy. You always heard them complaining about how expensive your products were. But you can just keep focusing on your best customers who love the performance that your product delivers. In the new market disruption, there's no incentive to react because you don't feel any pain. Those people were never buying your product in. Anyway, now what happens is for time, the product, the disruptive product improves to the degree that your customers and your original product start fleeing for the new disruptive product. And that's when you see the great companies topple. Disruption is purely a theory of competitive response. It just explains whether your strategy is likely to to generate a response from the incumbent or not. Yeah. Well, let's let's apply this then to Tesla because I mean the the, the gentleman sure. that, came, that came to uh, to Clayton, you know, was making the case that they're disruptive because he says, well, they're doing their Silicon Valley, they're a little company, mm-hmm. they've got this uh, this this electric drive technology, and on on top of that, they got this counterintuitive marketing where they're going direct to the buyers. Um, right. That would seem on the surface to be disruptive but in, in by your definition not necessarily so how does where where is tesla then in this scheme sure. as you see them sure so an important thing to note here is that disruption is a descriptor and a theory that evaluates strategy it does not evaluate technology okay. and so it's important to break apart the fact that a single technology can apply can be applied either in a disruptive or conversely what we would call a sustaining way because it sustains the trajectory of performance that the incumbents have developed. And our view of Tesla is that it's a fantastic product. It is the best car I've driven hands down, but that makes it sustaining. And so selling a product that has an average list price of $100,000 and performs better than the incumbent's offerings is something that is clearly a performance improvement as we define it and it doesn't fit into the sustain or into the disruptive strategy criteria that we've developed now it's important to note that tesla is doing a lot of things and our analysis is of the strategy they're using to design and sell cars and so they certainly have a differentiated sales model that's interesting to us They are using a very different technology platform, and that's interesting to us. But it's the way they've chosen to position those in their strategy that we define as being sustaining or not disruptive. Right. Well, I think one of the interesting points you make is that, I mean, the way a lot of us in the EV industry are saying, well, they're going to build this high-end product, and that gives them the critical financial mass and Mm -hmm. market penetration that they need to begin to come further down to where everyone's expectations are, well, I can't wait to 2017 when the Model 3 comes out. Um, and, right. then, and then they'll be profitable uh, because they're building lots and lots and lots of cars and they've got a gigafactory to supply the batteries and, and so on. That, that doesn't appear to, uh, to, you know, in your estimation, doesn't appear like that may be a long-term, successful long-term strategy. Right, so it's interesting to think about how the competitors are going to respond in that environment. And so what's interesting right now is that if you think about the person who buys a Model S versus, say, a BMW 7 Series, right? They they both list roughly in the same price class. They have a lot of the similar amenities. 
and the people who are buying Model S's today are, are buying them mostly because they have a differentiated technology platform. They're electric vehicles, right? There are some other attributes that these people prefer, the Silicon Valley ethos, the, the brand of Tesla, the made in America um, that they have, the you know, brand they have. But really it comes down to the fundamental difference is the electric drivetrain. And so now imagine that you are BMW and that person says, you know, I, I used to buy a 7 Series, but I really just want the, the Model S because it's electric. What do you do? Well, there, there really isn't anything you can do in the short run because right. you're not going to make an, an all-electric 7 Series. That's a very expensive proposition. Uh, you, you can't really do much else. Maybe you offer them price discounts. And so you say to them, well, we'll give you $10,000 off. Well, there's two problems with that. The first is that you can't discriminate your prices by individual consumers. You have to offer the same price to everyone. Everybody, and so yeah. now you're discounting the vast majority of your sales, which would have happened anyway. You have to discount to keep that one marginal consumer from buying the Model S. Yeah. And the other problem that you have is the person who can afford a $100,000 car isn't picking one car or the other because of the price on the margin. They're picking it because they prefer the one car on this attribute versus the other. Yeah. Well, the issue with as you expand, the problem Tesla is going to face isn't so much expanding into down into bigger markets. It's trying to grow share within each market. And I'll explain that. And you can imagine there are people who have the same preferences as Model S consumers today who are budget constrained out of the Model S market, yeah. right? I yeah. really want an all electric car, but I've only got $40,000 to spend. All right. When the Model 3 launches, if it costs less than $40,000, they're very happy. Now they can buy that or they can buy a used Model S, which you know retains resale value. But all else equal, they're always going to prefer an electric drivetrain to a gas drivetrain. The problem happens when you start trying to expand your share within market, you start having to, to sell to people who care less and less yeah. about the drivetrain platform. Yeah. And so now imagine the consumer who, and, and real quick, uh, to, to understand what I mean by this, you know, people buy on very different attributes. And so you might like convertibles and I like SUVs. Well, neither one of us is right or wrong, but if I can only buy an, a convertible, you're happy and I'm unhappy, so I'm not going to buy it and you are. Right. And so imagine that on the drivetrain now, you have customers who decide what to buy on all of these different attributes, and the drivetrain really doesn't matter that much to me. You know, electric, okay, it's, it's the same as gas because it gets me where I'm going, and maybe it's cheaper in some ways and it's not cheaper in other ways. But you now see all of the different things that the automakers can compete on. And so a big problem right now is that if you don't want a four-door hatchback, you can't buy a Tesla. Yeah. You might really want an electric vehicle, but for whatever reason, you need an SUV. And so you say, man, I'm really excited for that Model X to come out, but until then, I'm going to buy the Porsche Cayenne you know, or right. whatever it might be. And so imagine now as, as Tesla continues trying to expand – that's a massive issue from a from a model variety standpoint. I, I went on online the other day and I counted on Mercedes and BMW and Audi's website. There's 13 to 14 different model types you can get. And now this is not different engine sizes or different tr performance trims. This is right. different models that you can right. start spinning out. Yep. Tesla has one. And so you can imagine how difficult it is to get those people to buy those cars. And back to price, our favorite you know, tool that we can use, the way that people make decisions about what products to buy is a two-step process. The first thing that you do is you say, what's my minimum performance need? And you look for products that satisfy that. Anything that doesn't satisfy that minimum performance need, you don't consider, you just ignore it. As soon as something satisfies that minimum performance need, you now say, okay, I'm going to rank all of the different things in my consideration set based on performance, and I'm going to then see what the highest to lowest performing spread is. And so then you now understand in absolute 
what do you prefer most and what do you prefer least? All right. Well, the second step that you have then is you, you divide that by price to come away yeah. with a value. All right. And that price to value relationship then makes your final ranking. And so that's what you choose to buy is the highest value item, gives you the most performance for the least price. Well, that gives automakers a huge weapon because now I can go into someone and say, well, you might prefer the Tesla a little bit, but I'll give you $15,000 off or I will give you another discount. And if in absolute people are deciding only on the platform, electric versus gas, that doesn't work. When you start growing share and you need to start convincing people who don't care as much about the yeah. drive platform, yeah. that price weapon becomes very powerful. And, and so you can see now how the incumbent automakers can fight back even without ever launching an electric vehicle. Now, it's clear that they are starting to launch electric vehicles, right? And so yeah. you can imagine that as Tesla starts to prove the market, more and more of these incumbent automakers are going to launch electric vehicles. So that's, that's the issue from the competitive perspective that we've identified that is going to create problems with trying to grow the share within each market that Tesla can take. Okay, well, one of the things I find interesting, find interesting. is that you're talking about in this um, that the real disruptors now would appear to be neighborhood electric vehicles and electric utility vehicles or what you call EUVs. How, how, how is a golf car a disruptor compared to a Tesla Model S? Absolutely. So, so to be clear, this very much fits our definition of disruption, right? This is all about does it fit the theory of disruptive innovation. Right. And that means that you have to start at the bottom. You need to have a product that initially has less performance as the mainstream market would evaluate it, but also offers dramatically lower price. And that's what we found with neighborhood electric vehicles. We are certainly not saying that today the average person is cross shopping a gem <laughs> electric car yeah. with a Toyota Camry, you know, or whatever, right. I, or the Honda Accord or the highest market share car in the country. What we're saying is it comes back to that decision making process that people use. Early on, the disruptive product isn't good enough to fit into most people's minimum performance criteria. Right. And so you don't even think about them. That's not the gem or any other neighborhood electric vehicle. That's not a car. I would never think about right. that as competing. But as they improve over time more and more, they start to get better and they come into the minimum performance criteria for the least demanding people in the car market. And then what happens is because disruptive innovations by their very characteristic have a business model that allows them to be profitable at lower prices, when you take the performance and you divide it by price, you get a much better value. Uh, Why is that you're willing to give up 10% performance for 20% better price. Yeah. And this is where the disruptive strategy puts you on equal footing with the incumbent because sure, it might not be as good as what the, uh, the competitor is offering, but for, for a lot less on a relative basis, I'm willing to make that trade off. And so what's important also to think about is how and why do these products improve? Well, what we're seeing is that in the case of neighborhood electric vehicles, they're being used in environments where the things that we would consider to be performance detriments are actually benefits. Yeah. So that's like a golf community. Uh, my parents live on a small little town in Florida. And you know, for them, driving around uh, at, to the grocery store twice a week doesn't require a full-size car. Now, they have one because that's what they buy. But you could imagine that in a golf community or in a little town in Florida, not having air conditioning isn't a problem. Not being able to go very far is not a problem because you wouldn't anyway. Right. The fact that the vehicle is slow is actually better for the, the pedestrians. Yep. It doesn't make any noise pollution or it doesn't have any tailpipe pollution. So those are all performance benefits. And so with each unit that's sold, the company that makes them reinvest that profitability into making the product a little bit better and a little bit better. And so disruption is a process, not an event. It takes years for this to evolve and to happen. We're seeing it just start to emerge now. 
And so no one is saying that tomorrow or even next year, these products are going to be competitive with mainstream cars. What we're saying is that the neighborhood electric vehicles are emerging in a pattern that is not likely to induce a competitive response from the mainstream automakers because it's so absurd on the surface. Yeah. They would compete. Whereas Tesla, every single automaker has them on their radar screen. Yeah. And every single automaker is de designing a strategy to compete against Tesla. Right. Well, what, well what's, yeah, what's sure. interesting in this respect, of course, is what we see happening in China. You referenced that uh, mm -hmm. in your, uh, um, your paper. Uh, and others are making note of that as well, that what's happening is, is that the large car makers there, whether it's the, uh, you know, Shanghai International Auto or whether it's Geely or, you know, mm -hmm. or Tesla for that matter, uh, are having difficulty selling their full-size electric cars, uh, at least in significant, I mean, it's starting to change a little bit, but at least in sort of significant numbers, certainly not well. within what the government in Beijing has been hoping for. On the other hand, you've got these hundreds of little guys that started off making bicycles and then they made electric bicycles and then they laid a, made electric motor scooters and now sure. they're making neighborhood electric vehicles, little low-speed electric vehicles. They did something like close to what, a quarter of a million of those last year? Uh, you know, I, I, I believe I read on your website actually that somebody has just said you had a link to an article. Yeah. Uh, there were 400,000. Yeah, that's right, 400,000. Yeah. Which is yeah. amazing. I had I had not seen that large of a volume number until you reached out to me and I looked at your at your yeah. website. Yeah. So I'm learning from you, thank you. Uh, <laughs> but what's interesting about this is, you know, if if you're trying to sell electric cars that have to outperform traditional internal combustion engine cars, in a market like China or the U.S. that doesn't have robust infrastructure, it's not surprising that you're not going to see a dramatic uptick. The reason that we would say these low-speed electric vehicles are working in China is the alternatives to the people are worse than the cars. Yeah. And so people who are buying these vehicles have the alternative of a bicycle or a moped, public transportation or walking. They are not ever considering cross-shopping a traditional automobile with these low-speed electric vehicles. And so the fact that they are underperforming relative to, the, to what we would consider the competitive set doesn't matter to them. And yeah. so they're perfectly happy to have a vehicle that will only go a short distance, won't go very fast, because it's better than walking better than or <laughs> yeah. And so that fits what we would call the pattern of new market disruption. And we think that it's very interesting that a lot of the mainstream media is saying that the market, the Chinese market is just clearly not ripe for electric vehicles. That China, Tesla can't sell there and you know the manufacturers you mentioned can't sell there. Therefore, China just isn't a good market for electric vehicles. Not true. When <laughs> outside of right outside of and it's it's very much uh, a function of you know if it doesn't happen in Shanghai or Beijing <laughs> it must not be happening yeah. but right outside of the view of the of the the mainstream market is all of these low speed electric vehicles that are growing like wildfire yeah yeah exactly so brings us then to the conclusion of your paper um, where you're suggesting that what Tesla should be doing, which I really find interesting in this context, is they ought to be reaching out to Polaris, who now owns GEM, and saying, let us help you improve the technology in your GEM vehicle. In other words, we should, they should be focusing on building batteries and selling those batteries and then the drivetrains. That's their future, I think, is what you're saying. We we don't we believe that they shouldn't even limit themselves to Polaris. They yeah, should well, contact yeah, sure. anyone that wants to sell an electric vehicle. So there's another theory that Clay has developed, which is called interdependence and modularity. Okay. And it's it's based on the engineering realization that there are interdependent interfaces and there are modular interfaces in products. Right. The same thing happens in markets. And what we would imagine happening is when the world electrifies. The electric vehicle could bring us back to a modular architecture of the automobile. And yeah. so what's interesting is that if you look at markets over time, they go through a pattern of interdependency back to modularity, back to interdependency. And I'll give you a great example of what the two are. 
Apple's iPhone is a very interdependent product. They sell you the hardware, they sell you the software, they link it with their other software in a very closed wall. Android is very modular. You buy software from one person, you buy hardware from another person, and they work together. All right. Well, in the early days of the automobile industry, it was a very modular industry. You had coach builders who built bodies. All right. And you had true you know, manufacturers of engines and drivetrains. And then the coach builder would put their body onto the drivetrain. And what we can imagine happening is if the world goes electric, there's a very strong case to be made that it goes modular as well. Right. So now it would be cheap enough to build body styles that you could have custom coach builders emerge. And in that world, Tesla is perfectly positioned to sit at the most profitable point. And that point is the last point of interdependency in that product, which we see as the battery drivetrain linkage. Right. Tesla is clearly the world's leader in that technology. And if they were to become what I like to call an arms merchant, <laughs> making standardized drivetrain and battery components, they could theoretically win from all of the competition that emerges. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone has a Tesla hard Tesla drivetrain in it. And so we don't care whether it's badged as a Chevy or it's badged as a gem or it's badged as whatever other brand emerges. We're making money off of it. And that's what we would recommend to be a great disruptive strategy because as the disruptive neighborhood electric vehicles or electric utility vehicles emerge, you're selling to them and you're, you're riding that wave of success that they have without you having to take a bet on which individual brand or manufacturer will succeed. Right, exactly. Well, this, this is intriguing. One hopes that uh, Elon will listen to... <laughs> I'm not, you know, holding, I, I'm not holding my breath. But. <laughs> I haven't gotten any phone calls from him yet, but yeah. we, we love the concept and we think that the world is clearly moving in the trajectory of electrification. And so it's a function of when and who will dominate the market, not if. Yeah. And so we try to give our advice as being very neutral but that if we were allowed to, to whisper in the ear, that's what we would say. Right. Okay, well, here's your chance to whisper in his ear. Someone maybe will listen. So, hey, when does the article appear then? Or is it out so, already? So the piece that came out was the only piece that we're publishing out of that in the HBR. So okay. they wrote a piece on in what's called the Ideal Watch that describes the research that we did. Okay. Uh, I'm also publishing on their blogs a few excerpts of the of the main research piece that we did. Okay. Uh, it, it our original goal was to build a a very short op-ed length analysis, and as we got into it, Tesla is just such a fascinating case yeah. that it it grew more and more and more and more, and our our learnings became so great that there there's nowhere to publish it. Yeah. And, and that, long format. And so we've we've broken it up into a few small pieces, but I will send you the things that have been published thus far and for you to pass along to your readers or anyone oh, else that, who's interested. Oh, that would be great if you let me do that. I mean, you sent me that 11-page article which uh, which is I think sort of what sort of summarizes uh, the the main arguments of your uh, your findings, and right? Yeah, so that that one we would like to keep confidential and I'm I'm happy to have no, you have that. No but problem. We're, the articles that we're then producing are, you know, based on that summary okay. that we've learned. And so we've got some shorter versions. One came out today, I believe, that I haven't checked yet, but it should have gone live on the HBR website this morning. Okay. And I'll send a link to that as well. All right. Sounds great. Well, thank you so much. This has been delightful. I've enjoyed this very much. So thanks well, for taking thank the time. Thanks for having me. And I, I hope to see great things coming out of EV World in the future. You have a fan in me. All right. Well, thanks. I appreciate that. Okay. Thanks. A lot. All right. Bye bye. Take care. Bye bye.